Attention Duke Masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Trump Orb, Embassy Row, and Killing Informants. Plus this day in history with the Oregon Trail and our Song of the Day by Danger Mouse. Run the jewels in Big Boy on your morning monarchy for May 22nd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more for listener-supported media. Brought to you since 9-11-05, September 11th, 2005, is when we put the old Media Monarchy blog first up online. And now nearly 12 years later, we are quite the listener-supported success. And here we are just a couple of seconds in of launching another new week of media brought to you by you. Hope you're doing well whenever, wherever you are, my friends. We're glad when you join us live. A couple seconds after 9 a.m., mediamonarchy.com slash listen. We have our own stream now. Click that link and it'll open up your VLC, your iTunes, your Windows Media Player. kind of miss that. It'll also open up your Winamp, which, you know, pretty much takes us all back. Huge thanks to all our patrons, supporters, subscribers, cheerleaders, fans, so much more. Mediamonarchy.com slash support has the Patreon, the PayPal, the snail mail, and the Bitcoin. If you can give a little, I can give a lot, my friends. And also, of course, a huge, huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app for carrying the Morning Monarchy podcast that gets us up alongside some of the biggest names in alternative media. And hopefully when someone's about to go, eh, maybe I won't listen to Alex Jones. What's this Media Monarchy guy? I'll take that. Huge thanks, Truth Seeker app. And also a huge thanks to Jared and everybody at the growing RadioConfluence.com community. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. Oh, it's getting warm here in Portland, Oregon. And when it starts to get warm, when it gets over 80, and today we're supposed to hit 90 degrees, that means Jimmy busts out the air conditioner, which I actually bought for myself nearly five years ago. It was a pretty immediate reward I bought for myself when I quit smoking in the summer of 2012. It was another hot summer then, and I knew I wasn't going to make it in the state that I was in without a little bit of AC. So I got the AC in the window, so that's going to make me, it's going to make me a lot happier. So did that over the weekend, and also Friday night, went out to a little punk rock club called the Tonic Lounge, which was gigantic. It's you know one of those shows I find myself at, and I was like, oh, this is like the hardcore kids. Everybody has tattoos. Everybody has all black. I was wearing all black, but I am zero tattoos. Saw a man from New York called Black Marble. Dark wave, cool kind of new order, synthy sound duo, guys. Got to chat with him a little bit, got the record signed, as I am apt to do. Talked about Chris Cornell with him. You know, talked music stuffs, as I like to do. So I had a good time doing that. The funniest thing about it, as I was kind of sitting there, and you know, I'm on the older end of the audience set, as I often find myself, because I'm, I'm, I'm young and sexy. I go to the rock clubs with the kids, even though I'm almost 40. So I've been going to them for a long-ass time. The funniest thing, the way I could sort of distill it all down, the experience sometimes, when you look around at the crowds that, you know, hip punk clubs it's people younger than me dressed like people that are older than me that's what it is i finally hit upon it that's the hilarious part you're out it's 2017 it's like why is that dude why is that 24 year old kid dressed like my uncle jerry from circa 1983 (laughs) but had a fantastic time and i'm going to follow it up by going to see a little band called the jesus and mary chain tonight here in portland oregon so i'll keep you up to date on all that and of course all that musical stuff will seep its way into our daily dj set at noon that's right you get an hour of news in the morning as your morning monarchy and an hour of music in the afternoon that we call pump up the volume each and every monday through friday and again brought to you by you so um anything interesting going on in the news trump trip trump says there's a great feeling for peace And nothing says peace like billions of dollars worth of weapons. Right, my friends? Drain the swamp. Hope and change. Lather, rinse, repeat. Bullshit. Michael Flynn expected to invoke the Fifth Amendment. Ford names James Hackett as CEO as their challenges mount. And food stamps and Medicaid are on the chopping block in Trump's budget. So that's a quick glance at the breaking lamestream news. And of course, we appreciate you listening live. We're still running the Mixler chat Yes, I've got Discord all set up. I just haven't had time to really run it or get into it. The weekends really are time for domestic time, as they should be as well for you. Hey, that's a good question, Chef Jake. (laughs) Do we know? Does Drain the Swamp, does it say, you know, thank you, Satan, or something like that when you play it backwards? Like, yes, we can. Has anybody tried that yet? I bet they haven't. So I know you've seen... 
Trump's orb. It did not take long for it to completely take over the Internet. And even, of course, Cassie this morning said, oh, God, that thing you showed me, it's it's every, it's all everybody's talking about this morning. And even one of our older friends, who, of course, would poo-poo all the ridiculous garbage we've talked about for nearly 12 years on the show. But now, of course, hey, look who's all coming around. I, I don't want to be like a, like Alex Jones or anything, but this is weird. Yeah, welcome aboard. That's why I like to post that diehard gif. Welcome to the party, pal. We've been waiting for you. So I know you've seen the orb. I know it's probably going to be our album art today. You thought for sure that Dancing with the Swords would have, would have made it, but then, woo, we got a, a new contender that rocketed to the top of the charts. I know you've seen the orb, but I bet you haven't seen this. It's a letter. Thanks to Boing Boing, and originally shared via a site called Spiritual North. And again, everything we say and play always included in the show notes. We post the show notes that we're going to talk about ahead of the show, so you can follow along if you're listening live. And you can see this typewritten letter. It's a, it is a picture of the letter. Dated December 21st, 1987, from the desk of Richard Nixon. Dear Donald, I did not see the program, but Mrs. Nixon told me that you were great on the Donahue show. As you can imagine, she is an expert on politics, and she predicts that whenever you decide to run for office, you will be a winner. With warm regards, sincerely, Richard Nixon. There he is, that Richard Nixon man. He sure knew his 5D chess or possibly his 7D bocce ball. Is that what's that's pretty much what we're watching around the world? So let's just try and actually explain what it is, and then we can laugh about what it's not. The surreal photo is actually of President Trump helping Saudi King Salman and Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al Sisi open the Global Center for Combating Extremist Ideology. And what they were doing is touching a globe to switch it on, the Global Center for Combating Extremist Ideology. Now, it's a little known fact that if actually Jeb Bush tried to touch the orb, he would completely and instantly be turned into ash. People joke that it's also the Bannon egg. And it also looks like that thing in Total Recall, where you have to put your hand in the, the orb at the end. And that actually opens up the air in the atmosphere. I, I, honestly, the hardest part is just figuring out which exact picture to use for the album art. Oh, that's right. And people say it's also like it's something out of heavy metal. Look at me. I'm the sum of all evils. My power infests all time, all galaxies, all dimensions. Be very afraid of the Trump orb. Or, hashtag Simpsons did it, season 9, episode 24, the orb of ISIS. You know, the little song that they hear play when they crack it open after sneaking into the museum. The orb could be any number of things. Rumors of sinister dealing and occult plotting continue to dog Donald Trump, despite best efforts of lapdogs and Western media apologists. I think I had somebody tell me that the DPRK News Service Twitter account, no, that's really real, from North Korea. It's really totally not real. It's satire from two dudes who also run other satire Twitter accounts. But it is quite the hoot to follow, and because generally the pronouncements coming out of North Korea are so ridiculous, they almost don't really need parodied. So we can all have a great laugh at the orb, and look at the complete... <laughs> well, yeah, you can't spell Corbett without orb. I knew it. But all fun and games aside, my friends. Last October, the Saudi Arabia-led coalition bombed a funeral hall in Yemen's capital of Sana, killing and wounding hundreds of people. The scene was catastrophic. Beyond what I can tell or describe, there were burned bodies and dead bodies all over the hall. Soon after that unlawful bombing, the Obama administration suspended the sale of nearly $400 million in weapons to Saudi Arabia. It was a recognition, a long time coming, that the coalition's military campaign in Yemen had devastated that country, killed thousands of civilians, and brought it to the brink of famine. After the funeral bombing, unlawful airstrikes continued, but the decision to suspend arms sales sent an important message to the Saudis. President Donald Trump, in his first trip abroad as president, is going to send an alternative, deeply troublesome message. While in Riyadh this weekend, Trump announced more than $100 billion in arms sale deals to Saudi Arabia, nearly as much as Obama authored during his eight years in office. 
The deals include Raytheon bombs, Lockheed Martin defense systems, and BAE combat vehicles, and some some of the weapons whose sales had been suspended. The scars of unlawful airstrikes can be found across Yemen, where the Saudi-led coalition has carried out scores of attacks that hit homes, schools, markets, hospitals since March 2015, when it began its military campaign against the Houthi armed group and forces loyal to the former longtime president Ali Abdullah Saleh. Human Rights Watch, problematic in their own way, has documented 81 apparently unlawful coalition attacks over the last two years, many possible war crimes in almost two dozen of these cases, including the attack on the funeral hall, we were able to identify the U.S. weapons that were used. This all gets pretty gross and pretty obvious. And don't forget all those Toyotas as well. They're always in the deal. According to the United Nations, again, problematic in its own way, at least 4,773 civilians have been killed and 8,272 wounded since the conflict began, the majority by coalition airstrikes. The war has driven Yemen, already the poorest nation in the Middle East, towards humanitarian catastrophe. Both the coalition and Houthi Salah forces have blocked or restricted critical relief supplies from reaching civilians. Seven million people face starvation and cholera ravages parts of the country. Trump should have been urging the Saudis, Saudis to shift course by aiding by the laws of war. The laws of war. You gotta love those laws of war and holding those responsible for past abuses to account. Instead, he will effectively be telling them to continue as before, and don't worry, the flow of U.S. weapons will not stop. Trump, of course, putting Americans at risk as well. Continued U.S. arms sales to a country that's repeatedly violated the laws of war exposes U.S. officials to legal liability for aiding and abetting coalition war crimes. I saw some tweet that basically said, Saudi Arabia. Hey, Trump, come over. Uh, dude, I can't. I said you guys did 9-11. I've got $100 billion. Hello, bowing down. Put the thing on me. Let's all bow down. That's, that's the continuing. That's the continuation. There's a lot of show. There's a lot of yap yap. There's a lot of talk. But at the end of the day, they're going to bow down to... World War. New York Times correspondent Ben Hubbard is in Riyadh covering the visit and joins me now via Skype. Ben, this trip has been billed as an opportunity to reset the American-Saudi relationship. What needs resetting? Well, I think from the Saudi perspective, there's a lot of things that need resetting. The the Saudis, you know, which have been a American allies in the Middle East for many, many decades, felt yeah, I think, and, and you know, we could say that they felt very deceived under President Obama. There was anger over the way that Obama seemed to give up on Hosni Mubarak, another Arab ally, during Arab Spring protests. They were very angry at his his hesitancy to get more and to get involved in the in the war in Syria. And the Iran deal was a, was a huge blow to them. They very much felt that this, this president, who's supposed to be one of our great allies, went behind our back and made this deal with one of our enemies. So then after Trump was elected, there's just very much a sense here that this is a guy who understands us. This is a guy that we can do business with. This is somebody that, uh, you know, has said all the right things when it comes to things that we care about, which are fighting, you know, terrorist organizations and, and specifically with confronting Iran. Ben, let's talk a little more about business. Can you tell me about that $110 billion weapons deal that was struck today? Yeah, and it could end up being, I think, $350 billion over the next 10 years. They're going to build a number of high-tech helicopters here in the kingdom and uh, another of, uh, other deals that are expected to come through tomorrow, dealing with oil and technology and various other industries. Ben, has there been any reaction to Mr. Trump's statements that have offended so many Muslims? What's remarkable, I mean, I've spent a lot of time kind of outside of the, the, the you know, the, the area where all the officials are. The, yesterday I went to a, I went to a Harley Davidson rally, actually, and, you know, met all these Saudis who love Harley Davidsons. And it's quite amazing how many Saudis would just tell you how much they love Trump. They're just very excited about him. They feel like this is a guy that we can understand. And, and you know, you try to push him on these things. But what about all these things that he said about Islam or these things that he said about your country? And they seem much more willing than I think a lot of Americans to just dismiss it as campaign rhetoric, which is very interesting. So, you know, there's been a very concerted media campaign inside the kingdom. And I think it's trickled down. And I think a lot of people have just kind of felt that like, OK, this is going to be a guy that we can we can do business with. Ben, Mr. Trump is slated to give a speech tomorrow. Uh, is there any indication with the tone, the tenor, the content? No, and it's interesting. This is the one thing that a number of Saudi contacts I have have expressed some discomfort over. They've kind of said, hmm, you know, Trump is going to give a speech about Islam. Hmm, like let's, 
we need to see how this is going to go. So I wouldn't say people are too scared of it, but it's one thing people have kind of, you know, it's raised a lot of eyebrows, we could say. You know, we can assume that what, what, what really interests him in this relationship is fighting extremism. And I mean, the Saudis have been under threat from the Islamic State, and the Islamic State has carried out a number of attacks inside the kingdom, deadly attacks. And so I think, you know, this is another area where they think that they can they can do business with Trump. Now, I just to keep ratcheting up the unbelievable levels of, of, of again, it's just like we say, when things are so ridiculous, it's kind of tough to satirize it when things are almost a parody in and of themselves. So extra bonus points for anyone who noticed. That's Allison Stewart over there on PBS NewsHour. You might remember Allison Stewart from, you hear it first, MTV News. We are of that generation where our trusted news leaders were introduced to us very early. You know, like Anderson Cooper on Channel One. But I, I think I can actually ratchet up the ridiculousness about eight more points. Country singer Toby Keith performs for all male audience in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. If you think you got to see the orb footage, you got to see the footage of Toby Keith rocking out on stage. Oh, oh. Sword solo. Toby Keith, whose songs include Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue, you know, talking about putting a boot up them Arabs' asses. He also sings a song called Whiskey Girl. Saudi entertainment website Lamped advertised the concert and said it will be free. It's nothing's free. Yeah, beer, beer for my camels, I think, was the was the encore it was free and featured an Arabian lute player oh so it was lute solo see you again <laughs> Simpsons did it Otto's played a lute solo on the Simpsons before the event is open to men only and requires formal dress Trump and the king made a little cameo appearance Saudi Arabia has invited, of course, several prominent figures, you know, like prominent Fox News host Brett Baer, and scheduled numerous events to dazzle Trump. Holy moly, fantastic indeed. You are listening live to The Morning Monarchy. It's Monday, May 22nd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, cultural critic of critical culture, and I think probably the biggest story of the past week and this was pre-Trump trip. Unbelievable footage. I know we live in unbelievable times, but there are times now, of course, when we see things, we have to really have our critical thinking caps on and go, is that real? Is that true? I'm going to double check that. The footage I saw outside the Turkish embassy in Washington, D.C. is unbelievable. I thought it was fake. And I can't figure out if the camera footage that we have is from the body cams the cops were alleged to have. It looks like a drone flying around amid this violence going on outside the Turkish embassy. America's top diplomat, that's Rexon Tillerson, says the Trump administration has expressed its dismay to the Turkish government about a violent confrontation between Turkish security officials and protesters outside Turkey's embassy in Washington. John, it's the type of scene you expect to see in Ankara, where the Turkish president has detained nearly 300,000 political opponents in the wake of last July's attempted coup. Yesterday afternoon, we witnessed what appeared to be a brutal attack on peaceful protesters at the Turkish ambassador's residence in the 1600 block of 23rd Street Northwest. As a result of the assault, 11 people and one police officer were injured. 
two people were arrested last night for aggravated assault and for assaulting a police officer outside the Turkish embassy residence. Witnesses said the attackers were members of the Turkish president's security detail, among them his personal bodyguards. Men in black suits working for the Turkish government crossed the street and attacked the Kurdish and Turkish Americans protesting uh, Turkey's attacks on U.S.-backed Kurdish fighters in Syria. The Turkish leader had just met President Trump at the White House and was inside the embassy residence when the melee occurred at 4.30 p.m. Last week, President Trump authorized the U.S. military to arm the Kurdish fighters in Syria, angering President Erdogan. The D.C. police chief apologized to D.C. residents for shutting down all the main D.C. arteries during rush hour as a result of the violence yesterday. Uh, I passed by the aftermath on the way home, John, from work last night and can say there were dozens of police vehicles lining Massachusetts Avenue near the embassy residence, blocking the way to Vice President Pence's house just up the street. There were a number of ambulances on the scene as well. You don't expect to see these kinds of scenes in the nation's capital. D.C. police officers were wearing body cameras, I'm told, but the police chief would not confirm reports that two of President Erdogan's bodyguards were arrested but their for their involvement, but released because they had diplomatic passports. He referred questions to the Secret Service. Those who were arrested appear to be residents of the United States. Secretary of State Rexon Tillerson says Turkey's ambassador has met with State Department officials and that it was made clear during that meeting that the U.S. believes that Tuesday's clash was simply unacceptable. Tillerson told Fox News Sunday that an investigation is underway and that he'll let that finish before any, making any decision about any kind of formal response. Again, I don't know exactly. It's sometimes tough to put into words how unreal the footage looks it looks like it's it looks like it's super hot new movie footage N perhaps not unlike that assassin with the black suit and the skinny black tie in the art gallery other shocking footage that has since emerged is video of turkish dictator erdogan ordering then watching, because he likes to watch, as these multi-generational serial killers do, watching the violence Tuesday near the Turkish embassy in Washington, D.C. The CIA's VOA has that footage for you. You're listening to the Geopolitics edition of Your Morning Monarchy, and it's pretty rough all around the world. And again, I, I will include everything we say and play in the show notes. If you got a good kick out of the orb and got a good chuckle out of that, you must see the footage of the Turkish embassy violence. Again, I don't have it. It's unreal is the best way to describe it. There's a lot of unreal seeming situations around the world. A young demonstrator has died from a gunshot wound to the chest, raising to 48 the number of people killed in seven weeks of protest against Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro. Now ask your Mad Al loving friends about Venezuela. You'll hear crickets or perhaps see a tumbleweed float by. The president personally denounced a brutal attack on another man he said had been taken for a government supporter during one of several massive demonstrations across the country Saturday demanding early elections. The man identified as Orlando Figuera, Figuera, 21, beaten, stabbed, burned. Like Islamic State terrorists do, Maduro said. Figura was hospitalized with first and second degree burns over half his body and for six knife wounds. The death occurred earlier in the western city of Valera. The attorney general's office said gunmen there opened fire Saturday on an anti-government demonstration. At that moment, Tehran Aguilar received a bullet in the chest, the office said in a statement. Also wounded in the shootings were an 18-year-old male and a 50-year-old woman. In some cities, the protests degenerated, degenerated into clashes between demonstrators demanding elections to replace Maduro and police and government troops. Growing insanity. A human being is set on fire at a peaceful demonstration by the opposition in Caracas, Venezuelan Information Minister Ernesto Villegas said on Twitter, posting a video of the Figuera incident. Maduro blamed the leaders of groups of mercenaries. And this is another easy situation, like a lot of these situations, which I generally recommend you never get involved in, because it's so easy to fake violence. We're only seeing how easy it is to fake virtual flag terrorism online. 
But all you got to do is have some cops to put on the punk outfit, and then they are out in the mix. The Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, blasted opposition protesters on Sunday for setting a man on fire during a demonstration. Maduro accused the protesters of targeting the man for being pro-government. Maduro identified the man as Orlando Figuera, 21. He was being treated in hospital for severe burns. Witnesses to the incident on Saturday afternoon said the crowd had accused the man of being a thief. About 100 anti-Maduro protesters doused Figuera in gasoline and set him on fire. An opposition activist was shot dead the same day, bringing the death toll after seven weeks of protests to 48. The mayor of a municipality in the eastern part of Caracas said 46 were injured in Saturday's protests while in the Caracas suburb of San Antonio, Los Altos. The youth was wounded by gunfire. Since the protests began on April Fool's Day, hundreds of people have been injured and some 2,200 detained, 161 of them jailed on orders of military courts. We've talked about the tribunals in past geopolitics episodes of Your Morning Monarchy. Seven in ten Venezuelans reject Maduro's leadership, according to private surveys, amid widespread economic devastation aggravated by the drop in the prices of oil, Venezuela's chief revenue source, in 2014. Longer chains, bigger cages, we want a new owner! Let's continue to look around the world, my friends. As again, we return to the Philippines. As they should have stronger ties with Russia and China, as Western nations are only interested in double talk and disregard Philippines' interests, so says President Rodrigo Duterte, talking to RT and other Russian media ahead of his visit to Moscow. The Philippines' leader arrives today, May 22nd, for a five-day visit. A lot of National Lampoon's world leader trips going on. Duterte said that while he has nothing personal against Washington, his country needs a change in its foreign policy to separate it from American interests. Quote, I have nothing against America. Trump's my friend. But my foreign policy has shifted. I want to deal with China and Russia because in Western world, it's double talk. You treat me as if I'm your colony still. You must be kidding. We're an independent country. I want my country to be treated with dignity. Duterte has repeatedly expressed his desire to have countries such as China and Russia provide, of course, military hardware for the Philippines. This week, Defense Secretary Delfin Lorenzana signed a letter of intent with Chinese state-owned arms manufacturer Poly Technologies on future purchases. Duterte is expected to sign a similar agreement in Russia on his visit to Moscow and St. Petersburg, speaking again to Russian media ahead of his visits. Duterte said he will not leave Philippines' national security dependent on Washington. If my country collapses, who will bring it back? The U.S.? We need weapons. Russia sells weapons. No conditions. With the U.S., it's a different story. They make conditions. But I'm not going to stand on bended knees. The Philippines is a former U.S. colony, which has a military alliance with its former master. For decades, three-fourths of its arms purchases came from U.S. suppliers. Duterte said he does not want his country dragged into a potential U.S. confrontation with China. They want me to fight with China? With what? Do I have cruise missiles? It's going to be a massacre. And then what? We'll sit at the bargaining table and be like, I want this. And they say, I want that. Do I look stupid? In some ways, Duterte is, is somewhat a tough-talking Trump counterpart in a lot of ways, or at least he'd like to think that he is. Having been accused and found guilty of rigging and manipulating virtually every possible asset class, perhaps it was inevitable that Deutsche Bank, currently on trial in Milan, Italy, for helping Banca Monte de Pesci conceal losses, as first reported last October, in Deutsche Bank, charged by Italy for market manipulation, creating false accounts. And they're now facing accusations that it was actually running an international criminal organization at the time. In the closely watched lawsuit, prosecutors used internal Deutsche Bank documents and emails to persuade a three-judge panel to rule that there were additional aggravating circumstances to the charges that German lender already faces related to various derivatives transactions. As Bloomberg reported, 
The material included a London trader's well done message to a banker who is now on trial. The reason why prosecutors are seeking expanded charges against the German banking giant is that by allowing prosecutors to argue that the bank's market manipulation crimes were committed by an organization operating in several countries would lead to higher penalties if they win a conviction. Predictably, Deutsche Bank's lawyer, Giuseppe Iacconi, sought to block the move at Tuesday's hearing, saying there wasn't a clear connection between the original charge of market manipulation and the alleged aggravating circumstances. The trial for Deutsche Bank managers becomes more problematic after the judge's decision, says Giampero Biancolella, an attorney specializing in financial crime who isn't involved in the case. If proven, the aggravating circumstances may increase the eventual jail sentence for the market manipulation to a maximum of nine years. Let's all hold our breath. As a reminder, Deutsche Bank and Japan's Nomura both went on trial in Milan in December, accused of colluding with Monty Pashi to cover up losses that almost toppled the Italian lender before its current battle for survival. Thirteen former managers of Deutsche Bank, Nomura and Monty Pashi, were charged for alleged false accounting and market manipulation, focusing on the German bank. Six current and former managers of Deutsche Bank including people named Michelle Fasciola, Michelle Foresti, and Ivor Dunbar, were charged in Milan last year for colluding to falsify the accounts of Monty Pesci, which itself is so insolvent it recently got its third state-funded bailout. But they were charged for colluding to falsify the accounts of Monty Pesci and to manipulate the market. As a further reminder, Michelle Fasola is the Deutsche Bank banker, bankster, who was implicated in the death of a Deutsche Bank senior risk manager, William S. Brokesmith, who was found dead in 2014 after committing a still unexplained suicide. So they're not just involved in running Ponzi schemes, they're also bumping people off. It's, it's kind of like this gangster movie I saw recently and talk about, oh, I don't know, all the time. Going back to the accusation that Deutsche Bank is a global criminal cartel, the prosecution's request to label Deutsche Bank as an international criminal association hinged on events that occurred in other parts of the globe's globe, sorry, one one orb, one orb to rule us all, <clears throat> including the possible manipulation of an index, which isn't the subject of charges in Milan. Specifically, as Bloomberg previously reported, a 2014 confidential audit commissioned by German regulator Baffin said that Deutsche Bank employees may have manipulated internal indexes to help ensure the success of the deal. The study, requested by Baffin, said an internal Deutsche Bank review described abnormalities in the values of proprietary indexes used to set the price for the Monty Pashi deal in December 2008. So they're making rigged deals even based on their own rigged numbers. Yeah, they're going to need their asses inspected for abnormalities. Another story, just seemingly huge, as there are many, many, many massive stories go on, going on. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people analyzing it, so we can't look at all of it. And again, it's easy to just get trapped and, and fall, down to, fall down to the orb. That's all we'll talk about. Let's head off to the aforementioned China for our last couple of stories before we come back home here to the States. So we get out of Fort Leavenworth. But up to 20 CIA informants were killed or imprisoned by the Chinese government between 2010 and 2012. The old gray lady reports the New York Times damaging U.S. information gathering in the country for years. It's not clear whether the CIA was hacked or whether a mole helped the Chinese to identify the agents. They said one of the informants was shot in the courtyard of a government building as a warning to others. The CIA has not commented on the report. Four former Criminals in Action officials spoke to the paper, telling them telling the information from the sources deep inside the Chinese government bureaucracy started to dry up in 2010. Informants began to disappear in early 2011. The CIA and FBI teamed up to investigate the events in an operation one source said was codenamed Honey Badger. And you, you know what the honey badger does not give. Honey badger don't give a fuck. The paper said this investigation had centered on one former CIA operative, but there was not enough evidence to arrest him. He now lives in another Asian country. 
In 2012, an official at China's security ministry was arrested on suspicion of spying for the U.S. He was said to have been lured into the CIA. No other such arrests have appeared appear to have reached public attention during that time. Matt Apuzo, New York Times journalist who worked on the story, told the BBC, which is where we're grabbing this text from right now, One of the really troubling things about this is that we still don't know what happened. There's a divide within the American government over whether there was a mole inside the CIA or whether this was a tradecraft problem, that the CIA agents got sloppy, got discovered, or whether the Chinese managed to hack communications. A few years later, in 2015, the CIA pulled staff out of the U.S. Embassy in Beijing after a hack blamed on the Chinese state exposed information about millions of U.S. federal employees, Little Eichmann's. If the events of 2010 through 2012 were helped by a similar hack, it was not one that was made public. The disappearance of so many spies damaged a network it's taken years to build up and hampered operations for years afterwards, even prompting questions from the Prince of Peace Fries himself within the Obama administration on, where my intelligence, bros? Officials said it was one of the worst security breaches of recent years. By 2013, the Chinese government seemed to have lost its ability to identify U.S. agents, and the CIA moved back to trying to build up its network. Mr. Apuzo continued saying in the report, quote, For many years, China and the U.S. have been locked in on this spy battle that's been going on behind the scenes. While doing this story, we uncovered that Chinese intelligence have been able to infiltrate an NSA outpost in Taiwan. It goes back and forth. The story was published during a temporary vacuum at the top of diplomatic relations between the two countries. The Trump administration has named Terry Branstad, the governor of Iowa, as its ambassador to China, but he has not yet moved to Beijing. Q. Tianka, China's ambassador to the U.S., has not commented, but in a recent press release, he mentioned the current positive momentum that the China-U.S. relationship enjoys. You're just going to have to find some other country to have relations with. An interesting follow-up to this comes from a site called Empty Wheel. Asking the question about a private military contractor we used to mention a lot on the old Media Monarchy episodes. And you can dig back into the archives and see all the coverage we did of those private military contractors and their intimate connection to false flag terror drills, war game exercises that somehow go live. One of those being SAIC. So Empty Wheel says the New York Times has a story about how China started rolling up CIA spy networks in 2010, the cause of which, the story says, still has not been solved. One possible cause is that a Chinese-American exposed America's spies to the Chinese. But the government was never able to establish enough proof that he was the Chinese mole to arrest, to arrest him, not even when they lured him back to the U.S. to try and bust him. So what this long article actually gets into the human intelligence and such. Is the three possibilities that they sort of lay out. I lay these three possibilities out because the timing of the moment the exposure became critical, 2010 and 2011, and the allusions to a hacked covert communication channel sound a lot like what CIA whistleblower John Reedy, R-E-I-D-Y, complained about seeing his employer, SAIC, oversee starting in 2005. While his complaint is heavily redacted, it sounds like he accused SAIC of providing inadequate security for a system serving the intersection of human assets and electronic reporting. Whoops, a- another accident of the Swiss cheese private military contractors. So the article title from Empty Wheel, Were Shitty SAIC Systems the Cause of the China's, or Cause of the CIA's China Disaster? Possibly. We'll have to leave that question there for now. And again, in a week of just... Amazing revelations and stories. And I think I made brief reference to it. And, and again, sometimes we hear these stories and they take forever to happen. I mean, even that Deutsche Bank story, once I started to go into it last night, I go, oh, wait, this is essentially a follow-up from a story from October or November. Sometimes the wheels move very slow. Sometimes they seem to move pretty fast. Chelsea Manning, 
the Army private who released a vast trove of U.S. state secrets and was punished by the U.S. military for months in penal conditions denounced by the U.N. as torture, has been released from a military prison in Kansas after serving seven years of a 35-year sentence. Manning walked out to freedom after 2,545 days in military captivity. She was arrested in May 2010 outside a U.S. Army base on the outskirts of Baghdad, having leaked hundreds of thousands of documents and videos downloaded from intelligence databases to WikiLeaks. The U.S. military confirmed that Manning was released on Wednesday morning. A couple hours after a release, Manning said in a statement, quote, After another anxious four months of waiting, the day has finally arrived. I'm looking forward to so much. Whatever is ahead of me is far more important than the past. I'm figuring things out right now, which is exciting, awkward, fun, and all new for me. Manning's disclosures included collateral murder. The footage of a U.S. Apache helicopter attack in Baghdad in which two Reuters journalists and other civilians were killed. Her seven-year ordeal has seen her held captive in Iraq, Kuwait, and the U.S., always in male-only detention facilities. In that time, she's waged a relentless legal battle to be respected as a transgender woman, winning the right to receive hormone treatment but still being subjected to male standard hair length and dress codes. Barack Obama granted Manning clemency in his final days in office in January. In commuting to time, served her 35-year sentence, the longest ever penalty dished out in the U.S. to an official leaker. The outgoing commander-in-chief said that justice had been served. I have two very different looks at Chelsea Manning's release. First... The the very quick and and easy kind of pop culture one. After serving seven years in a military prison for men, despite being a woman, Chelsea Manning is free. She was released Wednesday and opened up an Instagram account soon after. Over the past 24 hours, she has gained about 29,000 followers and counting and posted pictures of a handful of firsts. Steps of freedom, a slice of pizza, a glass of champagne, and her latest look. Yup, Manning posted a portrait of herself, and she looks lovely. Manning's lengthy sentence was commuted by President Obama after she sent him a letter in which she pled for freedom, citing terrible conditions and constant solitary confinement. So that's one take on the release of Chelsea Manning. And I know I've got it all linked up. I forget exactly who that comes from. I don't know if it's coming from Watch It or just coming from a simple online YouTube news channel. The very different version has us returning yet again to Fox News. Well, right now, uh, Chelsea Manning remains an active duty soldier for the U.S. Army, unpaid, but still receiving benefits, including health care benefits. Now, this is Manning back in 2013, known then as Private First Class Bradley Manning. The day after his sentencing, Manning announced that going forward, he was to be referred to as Chelsea, explaining she identified as a woman. Regardless of that announcement, she was placed in the U.S. disciplinary barracks, which is a men's facility. The ACLU filed a lawsuit on her behalf, and the Army was forced to provide hormonal treatment for gender dysphoria. Now, Janet, I mentioned she remains on active duty, receiving all of those benefits. The reason that that's important is because she is eligible for gender reassignment surgery, something that for the first time would be provided by the U.S. military. Shannon? All right, so what do we know about where Manning is now? We actually don't know, Shannon. This whole thing is sort of encloaked in secrecy, citing privacy and safety concerns for Manning. The Army told us that um, there's really nothing more that they can tell us. Um, As I mentioned, a lot of secrecy around her release. And we have been told not to expect Chelsea Manning or anyone else from her legal team to make any appearances. In fact, her lawyer stopped giving interviews this week in the lead up to the release. Now, in her appeal, Manning is arguing that her First Amendment right trumps the Espionage Act under which she was convicted. Um, And we have not heard from President Trump on this yet. However, he was highly critical when President Obama commuted this sentence. Shannon? All right, Alicia Acuna, thank you very much for coming live. Yeah, so extra points for slipping in the word Trump into that broadcast and for bringing up the interesting point that that'll be taxpayer-funded, sucker-payer-funded sexual reassignment surgery. No indication yet whether that slice of pizza came from Comet Pizza or not. Boom! There you have it, my friends. That's your look at geopolitics. Hashtag geopolitics. We spell it with a K, and that's how we track and trace all of the news that we talk about on these Monday Morning Monarchy episodes. Each day of the week, we focus in on a different area of the news, and each one has its hashtag. 
Monday's world news is geopolitics. Tuesday's technology as cyberspace war. Wednesday's food, health, and environment news as food world order. Thursday is dark, weird, occult news via holy hexes. And Friday's the entertainment industrial complex we call media memes. You can find all those tweets, all those hashtags, all in the Twitter feed at Media Monarchy. And it's all linked up. If my country collapses, who will bring it back? The U.S.? We need weapons. We're going to go out with brand new music from a pretty banging collab. Each name on their own is enough to elicit excitement when they have new music. But when you put Danger Mouse and Run the Jewels and Big Boy all together, we got a song called Chase Me coming up from some movie soundtrack called Baby Drive. I don't know anything about that, but I know I like those artists. So we're going to hear those on our way out on this geopolitics episode. But you know what's coming up first. Say it with me. Past is prologue. Let's look at this day in history, my friends. May 22nd. We begin with our focus this day in history. May 22nd, 1804. A massive wagon train made up of a thousand settlers and a thousand head of cattle, sets off down the Oregon Trail from Independence, Missouri, known as the Great Immigration. The expedition came two years after the first modest party of settlers made the long overland journey to Oregon. After the Lewis and Clark expedition of 1806, Americans became aware of the fertile free land in the place called Oregon. But the route taken by Lewis and Clark up the Missouri River seemed endless. Americans continued their search for a better method of traversing the continent. In 1841, a caravan of 60 men, women, and children in 13 wagons made it to Oregon. In 1842, John C. Fremont made the trip and provided maps of the route. The following year, a thousand people immigrated to Oregon along the trail, and the Great Migration was on. By 1870, when the Transcontinental Railroad made the trail obsolete, 200,000 people are estimated to have traveled the Oregon Trail. The trail started in Kansas City, Missouri, passed through Lawrence, and crossed the Kansas River in Topeka. The trail then headed northwest, crossing the Black Vermilion and Big Blue Rivers north of Tuttle Creek Lake, and on into Nebraska. The trail traversed Nebraska, Wyoming, Idaho, and Oregon before ending at the Willamette Valley south of what is now Portland, Oregon. It's Willamette, dude. You got that wrong. Remember we were talking the other day about, you know, mispronouncing city names is the easiest way to go. Ah, you don't know it. I told you our street that's spelled like couch here is pronounced cooch, so you'll know that when you come visit Portland. Willamette, it's called. May 22nd, 1804, the Lewis and Clark Expedition officially began as the Corps of Discovery departed from St. Charles, Missouri on this day. Continuing to look at this day in history, my friends, May 22nd, 1849, future U.S. President Abraham Lincoln is issued a patent for an invention to lift boats, making him the only U.S. President to ever hold a patent. Now, that kind of seems like something that old Trump train could, could actually beat. If anyone would actually hold lots of patents, I would imagine it would be him. May 22nd, 1900. The Associated Press is formed on this day in New York City as a non-profit news cooperative. It's funny to think that the Associated Press is older than the flying machine. May 22nd, 1906. The Wright brothers are granted a U.S. patent number 821393 for their quote-unquote flying machine. Jumping ahead a few decades, May 22nd, 1954, Robert Zimmerman celebrated his bar mitzvah on this day. That's right, you know him as little Bobby Dylan. May 22nd, 1955, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a Fats Domino concert was canceled because police feared a rock and roll riot would occur. Speaking of rock and roll riots, May 22nd, 1958, Jerry Lee Lewis announced that he had married his 13-year-old cousin, Myra. 1960, the Great Chilean Earthquake, measuring 9.5 on the scale, hit southern Chile. It is the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in history on this day, May 22nd, 1960. 
1964, LBJ launches The Great Society. May 22nd, 1966, Bruce Springsteen and his first band, The Castiles, recorded their first and only record, That's What You Get, backed with Baby Eye. It was never released. That's pretty interesting. May 22nd, 1973, here he is again. U.S. President Richard Milhouse Nixon confesses his role in Watergate cover-up. May 22nd, 1973. May 22nd, 1980, in New York, five gold records that belonged to Jimi Hendrix were stolen from the Electric Ladyland Studios. 1998, a U.S. federal judge rules that U.S. Secret Service agents can be compelled to testify before a grand jury concerning the Lewinsky scandal involving President Bill Clinton. May 22, 2002, two events happened. One, a jury in Birmingham, Alabama, convicts former Ku Klux Klan member Bobby Frank Cherry of the 1963 murders of four little girls in the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. That same day, in the District of Criminals, May 22nd, 2002, Chandra Levy's remains were found. You might remember her from the summer of 2001, when it was all about sharks. And what happened with Gary Condent's intern, Chandra Levy. Finally, May 22nd, 2015, the Republic of Ireland becomes the first nation in the world to legalize gay marriage in a public referendum. Now let's look at Media Monarchy This Day in History. Published to the site a decade ago today, May 22nd, 2007. Macho mistakes at ground zero as more more and more workers who inhaled the dust at ground zero fall ill. And of course, thanks to the Giuliani administration's failure to insist that all emergency personnel and construction workers at the site wear respirators. UK spy drones take to the sky, the secret history of Jerry Falwell, written by Daniel Hopsicker, and Chinese villagers riot over stricter population control. Those stories actually all published together on Media Monarchy under what I used to call News on the March, which I got from the newsreel at the beginning of Citizen Kane. News on the March! That's basically when I would publish up several stories in one post. The other story published to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, the White House and Pentagon are under increasing pressure from Congress and the public to end U.S. military involvement in Iraq, but the Pentagon is considering maintaining a core group of forces in Iraq, possibly for decades. As National Petroleum Radio reported, the Pentagon considers staying in Iraq for decades. Looking at birthdays today, there are some good ones. Hey, but I have to point out to our buddy Courage Sower, unless I misread it. It's not Mr. T's birthday today. It was Mr. T's birthday yesterday, May 21st. So Mr. T does not share a birthday with Sun Ra. He would have been 103 today. Space is the place. Birthdays on May 22nd, T. Boone Pickens. Simply referred to on Wikipedia as American Businessman. It's also Harvey Milk's birthday. You might know him, one, from the Sean Penn film, but I first learned about him from the Dead Kennedys version of I Fought the Law, where he talks about Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone, killed by Dan White, who would invoke the legendary Twinkie defense. Fascinating story. Also celebrating birthdays today, May 22nd, Richard Benjamin, American actor and director. I remember the first time I saw Westworld which stars Richard Benjamin and James Brolin. It's kind of interesting to see that Richard Benjamin was actually the lead guy. Different times. Paul Winfield, born on this day. CNN's Bernard Shaw, not to be confused, of course, with George Bernard Shaw. It's also the Unabomber's birthday on this day. Ted Kaczynski, born May 22nd, 1942. He's referred to as an American academic and mathematician turned anarchist and serial murderer. Elton John songwriter and right-hand man Bernie Taupin, born on this day in 1950. It's also Alaskan Senator Lisa Murkowski's birthday, but most importantly, my friends, and I know you're going to party down because of this today. Born on this day, May 22nd, 1959, Stephen Patrick Morrissey, English singer, songwriter, and performer. 
It's also Johnny Gill's birthday. You might know him as part of New Edition. Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, Mike, Johnny. He's the Johnny Gill. Naomi Campbell. And also Max Brooks, son of Mel Brooks. And of course, author, screenwriter. Not the least of which is World War Z. He was actually one of the first big interviews I landed when I was working at Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis. It was fun. So there you have it, my friends. That's your entire big old blast of morning monarchy. And I appreciate you being here. Again, I want to remind you, we've got our own stream. We are basically running our own stream at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, essentially from 9 to 5 Pacific time, 8 hours a day. Music, news, mashups, culture, it's all going to be there and it's only going to get better. We are just starting to build it, my friends. And we're going to go out with new music from Run the Jewels and Danger Mouse and Big Boy. I appreciate you being here. And again, I appreciate your support. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. That's what keeps us going and growing and moving and grooving, my friends. Chase Me is the song we're going out. And I appreciate you. That's your Monday Geopolitics Morning Monarchy for May 22nd, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com again, thanking you for listening so very much from the bottom of my heart. And reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedy said, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.